Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will discuss organizations that support women in business. And our special guests today are Gabby King-Morse, President and CEO of the Center for Women and Enterprise in New England, and Michelle Richards, Founder and Executive Director of the Great Lakes Women's Business Council. So thank you for joining us. Um, just to set this up, September 22nd is American Business Women's Day, and we're celebrating it by taking stock of, of the state of women in business. Um, just, just to uh, give you some statistics, 11.6 million American businesses are owned by women, according to the National Association of Women Business Owners. But women do face so many barriers in becoming business owners and executives so, Gabby, let's start with you. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, why it's important to have organizations like you to counsel women, to uh, clear some barriers, and also to educate men who, who really need to shift our, our attitudes on, on how we can uh, help uh, take advantage of the great talents of women in this country? Okay, well, you know, first of all, thanks for having me on the show today. So, you know, at the Center for Women and Enterprise, we've been working for 26 years around this specific issue because women are incredibly important, not just to our economy, but to our families. So all of their families, their communities, the main streets, they get it done and they support others around them. And so we can't underestimate the impacts that they have. The, the piece that we need to recognize is that women are not fully valued in this economy. And it's not just in their business building of which they're extraordinarily successful is that they're not realizing their value in the workplace, right? So you'll see statistics of women launching, white women launching businesses at twice the rate of white men, women of color launching businesses at four times the rate of men. And what we have to recognize is that women are getting it done because they have to. They're also the growing household, right? The main household earner more and more, 40% in this country, but in New England, it's even higher. Uh, the Center for Women and Enterprise covers New England. So it really is an imperative for all of us that we make sure that these women have the information, the resources, the connections, the financial investment that they need to be successful. And Michelle, it's, it's very easy for us to be critical and see the most um, extreme examples of disempowerment of women. We're seeing this right now in, in places like Afghanistan. It's very easy to look outside of ourselves. But when we look inside to the United States, we, we have to be cognizant of our, of our history and also our educational systems, how our banking systems uh, are, are tilted could you talk a little bit about your work, and and then let's let's really get into some of the some of the fundamentals of the education system, of the banking system, of mentoring, of sponsorship, of all, of all those different uh, issues. But talk a little bit about your organization. Give us a kind of a, a sense of, of 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 who you serve and how you were founded as a founder. That's that's very interesting. Thank you, um, Mark. Great Lakes Women's Business Council was started 37 years ago. Um, I was real young then and uh, was, was a visionary and there were no women's business centers in the country. Um, and so the idea was that, that the way to change the game for women is to allow them to control their financial destiny. And instead of training them for jobs, allow them to gain assets so that they can generate wealth going forward in next generations. Um, that's how we began, and we have a, a wide myriad of programs. But in terms of banking, so we started out initially as a loan program because um, women and, and um, uh, ethnic minority populations have been highly underrepresented in the small business banking. And one of the things that people don't realize is that there's a lot of regulation in banks. And when it comes to home mortgage, there's all kinds of analysis that, that can be looked at by the feds. But when it comes to small business lending, it's very subjective. 
And so one of the pieces is, is that the lender is choosing the loans to be in their portfolio. They inherit someone, they come to the bank, and then they build up to roughly 150, let's say. And so part of it is finding a lender who believes that in what you're doing. And women get discouraged, as do the underserved minority populations. And then the other piece of it is that, um, so women are not aware that they need to shop it. And, and take that time. The other is, is that a startup business is considered to be less than two years old and people don't realize it doesn't mean that it's just in a business plan form. It means that you do not have two solid years of operations. And so um, that is a piece of education that is not presented to women. And then secondarily, there is a whole network of alternative financing programs, community development financial institutions were one, um, an, um, an SBA microloan program, which were one. And when you put those two together, that's like a thousand institutions around the country mm -hmm. that make loans as small as maybe a couple thousand up to 250,000. So sometimes you have to start with that alternative financing to get that two year, three year track record to become bankable. Well, let's let's stay with the uh, financial issues uh, for a moment. You know, if you take a look at how uh, banks work, um, and and it's it's perfectly understandable. There's nothing nefarious about it. You basically loan to the model that you've loaned to before successfully, right? You loan to the person that you've successfully loaned to in the past. So if you have a situation where African-American or Latino-owned businesses or women-owned businesses have not received access to capital in the past, they are automatically disadvantaged in the future, right? So how do we, how do we deal with that? Because on the one hand, there is a perfectly valid issue of risk mitigation, right? The lowest risk is the person to whom you've successfully loaned in the past, right? How do we shift that? Because it's a valid point. You cannot go to a banker and say, it, you can't legitimately go to the banker and say, you are not allowed to mitigate risk, right? Yes. So uh, Gabby, how do, how do you deal with something like that? Uh, you know, it's not just sweetness and light and education and we no. can all, you know, there, there, are, there are hard issues here. Of, okay. of, and this is just one, risk mitigation and the fact that it is less risky to loan to somebody that you've loaned to before. How do you deal with something like that? So this is where we really need to get at systemic challenges um, that we see, because it's also, as you, you know, Michelle had said, and, you know, re your relationship with your bank, you know, which women don't have a strong relationship, even if they have gotten loans, right? So with the PPP loans and what happened with COVID, we saw what happens when you don't have a strong relationship with your bank. But what we've started to talk about in New England um, is really thinking about not smushing the same money through the same tube that gets to the wrong person or doesn't get to the people that we're talking about. Really bringing women entrepreneurs to the table to talk about what works for them and really opening up the conversation. This is not a short-term fix. You're not all of a sudden gonna make people be risk averse. But the question I ask is why are we only using the markets, right? We know how important women are to our economy. We have, we can, there are tools that are a mix of market and philanthropy. We can start to turn the tide, turn the relationships, show the impact. So this is where we need to go. We can't just keep sending women to banks and we're gonna get the same results we've seen. We've seen the possibilities of community banks for this purpose. You know, Michelle can talk more about her CDFI. And this is what we have to do. This is what we need to do. This is the hard work. We've got to change the system. So maybe one of the things that we're talking about is there, there are risk mitigation policies the government enacts to encourage investments in various sectors, right? So the government will back in, in terms of home owner ownership. There'll be, there'll be a backstop, right? Mm -hmm. that, that reduces risk and allows the commercial uh, people to enter into the market. You see this in all sorts of things like um, investment in solar energy um, and, and these kinds of new technologies where the government will, will back and create risk mitigation strategies. Are we talking about perhaps having um, a, a classes of people 
uh, people who are, who are African-American women, people who have not had access to capital and create the same kind of program that you might have for a key industry, the steel industry, for example. And instead, you're basically backing people instead of instead of an industry. Michelle, what, what, what's your opinion on, on uh, an issue like that? I think that's an interesting idea because, of course, the federal government is providing most of the secondary market purchasing the mortgages, as you say, and large loans, right. you know, bundled loans. But when it comes down to small businesses, they become portfolio loans. So they're eating up the capital in the banks. And so if you had an incentive program that supported purchasing either certain sizes or uh, populations loans, it would create an incentive for them to make more loans. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you do it for the steel industry, why not do it for, for women in business, right? We just exactly. we just completed a, um, a, a poll. We asked, um, what, what are the biggest um, factors um, or the biggest challenges for women entrepreneurs uh, that want to open a business? And we found that, that people focused on three different things, lack of a business network, mentors or sponsors, attitudes, attitudes that tag women as being less capable, um, in, in the realm of business and family responsibilities that often fall disproportionately on women. Let's, we, we've talked a little bit about, about the attitudes and about uh, some of the responses. Um, and, I, and I can't remember who it was uh, talking about uh, the whole family issue. I think, Gabby, in your opening, you, you talked about, about the family issue. Um, you know, there's a big, big uh, discussion right now about uh, what, do, what do they call it? Human infrastructure and, and the whole idea of, of uh, how do you enable um, people to work because childcare becomes more affordable and so on and so forth. Uh, Michelle, um, do you see that as being part of your brief? Or are you more in the hard nosed, you know, this is if you want to open a business, you know, that's that's sort of our job. Um, or do you have um, uh, alliances uh, where you're talking about the other side of of, of um, helping women um, to uh, develop a business because you're reducing the, the family um, responsibility through uh, societal report, uh, support. We've definitely been involved in those kinds of policy uh, 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 purposes. And I would like to say though that um, we spend a lot of time growing businesses because women have to choose to get into business. And today, 1,200 women every day start a business. So starting it isn't the issue. It's growing and creating sustainability based on that oh. model. That's the real issue. And there's a lot of research resources in communities with, with small business development centers, with community colleges and so on that help people to write business plans and get started. The question is, how do you create sustainability? And that's what we focus on. So part of the sustainability issue is looking at, again, all of these other resources. And so 37 years has created a whole big network of partners. Um, and so we're working on the advanced issues. And some of those are, like you, you're saying about things like um, childcare, but part of that goes back to, uh, we have a group mentoring program. And that was really critical as we were, you were sharing about COVID is that we had pulled our, our women business owners and we have close to 2000 in our network. And um, one out of seven said that they didn't know if they were gonna be able to reopen their business. And so we created, we had just created and had a pilot program called Mentor We, where we bring in a couple of successful women business owners with a group of women who need to be mentored, not one-on-one, -on -one, but in a group and they learn from each other. And our goals are this, to help them to do business with each other, to teach them about answers, solutions, because they are the people in trenches. Now, what's interesting is we brought in women to be mentors who had gone through the 2008, 2009 economic meltdown as a business owner and brought those practices forward. Mm -hmm. So what you wanna do is you need to have that transference of knowledge within the network. One of the truths is, is that, this, that a game changer is helping women to create this network of, of support and doing business with each other and making referrals to each other. And we need this nationwide because there's all of these women-owned businesses, but the connectivity is short. 
So, so Daddy, are, you, are you also focused on the sustainability thing? I thought that what Michelle said was really interesting. That that you're, and and Michelle, um, forgive me if I if if I misunderstood. My understanding of what you were saying was that we're we're less focused on the first in, right? The first step toward finding a business. It's more once once a woman has. Okay, I understood you correctly. Then, Gabby, how do you look at? It? Are you to, are are you helping women? become first time business owners in the sense of, you know, helping them with their concepts, or is it mostly the sustainability piece? You know, once, once you're in, how do you, how do you thrive? How do you deal with problems yeah. like the pandemic? How do you survive through this time? How, how are your programs shaped? You know, uh, Michelle and I were talking about this, that really the Center for Women and Enterprise is positioned a little bit differently. We actually focus quite a bit on startup. And, you know, I think what Michelle talked about is critical. You know, we're in different geographies. It's about partnerships because to do everything soup to nuts, right? You're really kind of fooling yourself to say, I can do the whole piece. And so I think focus is is really important. We look at the importance of launch in things like capital preservation, right? Because you can have, you know, as, as Michelle said, we have so many businesses launching we need to make sure that the women that are launching them are making the right calculations about go or no go, right? And that's not gonna be our decision, but we educate so that they can really say, you know, I wanna make this business. We don't say, no, that's a bad idea or that's a great idea. We say, okay, if you wanna make this business, here are the things you need to assess. And we're gonna lead you through that process. And then you're gonna make a decision. You're gonna make a decision. And if it's no go, that's just as successful in looking about at that particular person's economic empowerment as a go, right? So it's, it's really, really important when we think about underserved communities, how they think through launching a business. You know, it's so important to, to think about that. Um, my first business was a bus transportation uh, company that I launched when I was in college. Um, I, when I think back in, in those days, had I been a woman or um, had I been black or had I been Latino sitting across from those people, um, I wouldn't, as, as a young person, I would not have been taken as seriously, I believe. Although I was sitting across from um, a woman business owner and, and a male business owner, there was definitely a sense of, of um, sort of conventionality about the relationship that was being forged. And that business failed. I mean, it was okay. I, you know, I, I lost a little bit of money. Uh, it was a great experience. But in order to get to the point where you are successful, you have to have the opportunity of going through that and having the mentorship that you're and, describing. And being able to, I mean, I'm, I make an assumption here, but having some generational wealth to fall back on, and we're talking women tend not to have as much savings. You're talking about women of color, generational wealth. So that kind of mistake. or I didn't have generational wealth. I went back to the gas station and pumped gas. And, okay, uh, and <laughs> I shouldn't have made that assumption. No generational wealth there, but but you're right. I had I had certain advantages, right, that, that are embedded in our society. And, and we have to recognize that when we're talking about women-owned businesses, that they really are being successful with huge obstacles in their way. So when you think about what they could do, if we remove some of these obstacles, if we increased the community connectivity, mentorship, knowledge base, and support, it's, it's a huge opportunity for us, for all of us. You know, we just completed a, a poll and we asked whether people have purposefully supported a particular business because it is owned or managed by women. And a full 91 percent said uh, yes, they had, they had, they had absolutely uh, supported a business because it was it was managed uh, or, or owned by by women. So um, as, as we're looking at, at how do we create sustained change, Michelle, you talked about sustained uh, success, right? Just, uh, a sustainable business. How do we create a sustainable shift in our systems here in the United States so that the next generation of women, our generation of women um, are, are having a, a much more level playing field, but the next generation of the women uh, also have certain advantages. It seems that a lot of the uh, inequality starts 
uh, very early with, um, with education. How do we uh, create a sustainable shift? Well, I, I think that's a good question. And so let me start by saying that while there are 1,200 women, women are starting businesses every day, the reality is that less than 2% of all women-owned businesses in this country reach a million dollars in annual sales. And less that, than 2%. That's an important number, right? Yes. So part of it is, is that we need, uh, we need for us to have change, we need to continue to create model organizations and programs that are able to, to create, to get them to that level. And what I'm telling you is that that field isn't very big. Um, most of our women's business centers focus primarily on the startups. And so, for example, and, and both Gabby's organization and my organization work with providing women's business certification. And that's a critical tool. So the federal government passed legislation that any major company that does business with the government has to work towards um, buying 5% of, of its goods and services from women-owned businesses. So we certify women-owned businesses as part of a national network. And that gives a leg up because then there's an additional door through the supplier diversity program that allows them to get educated and to get connected inside. So that's one tool in terms of uh, shifts and related to policy. Now, the other is, is that in our organization, 65% of all the women we serve now have over a million dollars in revenue. Mm -hmm. And that's a successful trend because I believe it's capital, customers, and capacity. And so capital, again, we talked about that we have some, some elements, we have some loans up to a certain level. And then our lenders, the people that make the loans in our, our organization come from the small business lending community and have connections. So they're able to graduate people to other financing. Um, capacity is, again, those connections, the mentoring, the education, and so on. And customers is, in the, is either, again, through certification, going to corporate customers, or it can be through the network and learning and marketing and so on. And so part of it is, is one, having model organizations that can show what can happen, the what if, answer the what if. The second is, and they need to be more directed. Personally, I think Congress, and I've spoken to the Small Business Committee for the House and the Senate several times, needs to focus on how do we grow these businesses to sustainability? Because that's really the critical issue, job creation and sustainability. The next is, is that programs like the Women's Business Enterprise National Council Certification Program nationally, we have to push more. Additionally, the federal government does buy directly from, from in commodities that are underserved by women. And so there's two certifications, women-owned small business and the economically disadvantaged women-owned small business. And we provide the women-owned small business certification. And that's another tool to do business directly with the federal government. So these are policies that are in place. But again, the reach, the resources, the education, the knowledge is- Navigating the maze, right? It's, it's navigating the maze of access, whether it's the capital or to uh, RFPs request for proposals or government contracts or, or uh, any of the uh, customers sometimes to uh, gain access uh, to those networks. Uh, Gabby, how, how do you look at the, uh, at the changes that need to take place? Are there educational components as well for, um, for girls going through middle school, high school, and then into, into college? Are there, are, are there attitudinal adjustments that we need to uh, really be thinking about systemically um, addressing? Yeah, I think I'll take the second. I don't focus as much in, in girls. Um, we really do focus on women launching their businesses. But I, so I see a key impact lever it is marketing. And not marketing for the entrepreneur themselves, but us literally changing the way this country thinks about women entrepreneurs. And so here's an example. Um, if you know Heifer International, Heifer International has, um, you can you know, buy a flock of geese or a goat and you can send it to a country where a woman is taking care of her family. And we all know in our hearts, but also Heifer has data behind that, that this woman is not just going to help herself. She's going to help that whole community to rise. We believe that. And so come holiday season, we get that Heifer International 
fundraising thing and we say, oh yes, I'm gonna send a goat you know, to Sierra Leone, right? But what we don't have a narrative in this country is that woman in Dorchester in Boston who is Boston. starting a bakery and she needs an oven, right? We need a competing narrative because it's just as true, yes. right? And, and what we don't have, and this was shocking to me, we don't have the data that Heifer International has for countries, for not for the United States. And we need to actually say, we got to show this because it's not just that we know it's true. We got to show the data. And that's something that we, we are absolutely going to make happen. Right. And we're going to see shifts in attitudes and we're going to sh be sh see shifts in resources. It's what, wonderful. What it's wonderful to be speaking with you about this. My, my grandmother came to this country as a refugee and became a designer in New York and had her own label and was a businesswoman, um, had a whole group of people who uh, worked for her. My mother then uh, uh, also non-college education, educated both of them um, or non-college graduates. Um, my mother founded a uh, firm Phillips Oppenheim, very well-known executive search firm. We're focusing also on nonprofits, but neither of them received this type of support. There were there were people they could talk with, very often men who um, were already involved in, in businesses, but they, the attitudes that they encountered were not necessarily uh, supportive. So this, this idea of group support and women helping women and, and uh, trying to uh, find allies in order to gain access, as you said, Gabby, to, to markets, um, as you said, Michelle, to capital, uh, so very important. Michelle, let, uh, let's give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. But before we do that, um, we, we asked a, a, another poll uh, question. We said, uh, making things better, what is the most important solution to leveling the business playing field for women? And 100% people say we all must adjust our attitudes. It's attitudes. And I guess that makes sense given that it's attitudes in finance, it's attitudes in marketing, it's attitudes in, in the government, it's, it's attitudes within management and partnerships, right? Michelle, how do you see the thing that we need to do uh, as you take us out uh, on this discussion? Well, attitudes are really important and understand that these women business owners who are trying to scale are facing, they come from the same society and they have the same experiences with those attitudes that this is just a side job or, or a wish. Um, and these are people who are making hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars in revenue. So it, it definitely societal shift is critical and, and the impact that women have. But going back to what Gabby said, the bottom line is, is that we do not have the research. There used to be a center for, for, for women and business research and it was stopped being funded by the federal government. We need to have data driven information so that we can initiate national um, policies and practices that support women based on facts. And that is the way that we create change instead of based on opinions and, and, and antidotal information. A really important point, you know, if we're going to be a strong America, if we're going to have a strong civil society, we have to um, take advantage of the talents and the gifts of, of all of our citizens, men, women, people of all uh, races, ages, uh, abilities, disabilities. Uh, Gabby King-Morris, President and CEO of the Center for Women in Enterprise in New England, and Michelle Richards, founder and executive director of the Great Lakes Women's Business Council. Thank you so much for uh, helping us to understand the issues. Thank you for helping to educate me. I, 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 I so appreciate it just on a personal basis. Thank you, boards. Thank your staffs. Thank you. Thank your partners. And stay safe. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Have a great day.